first 80 aircraft were completed. By the end of April, 200 more were ready. In May, the month the war ended, 500 Volksjager would have rolled off the assembly lines. And 1,000 per month would have been built starting June 1945, only six months after the first flight. To fly these planes, the training of Hitler youth pilots began on gliders. To ease transition to the Volksjager, Heinkel supplied a two-seater glider version, the Model S. Without its BMW turbojet, the Model S lacked the distinctive humpback appearance of the fighters. The undercarriage was fixed and not retractable. The idea behind the People's Fighter project was to train thousands of Hitler youth to fly these things. Now that was obviously a, a, a silly idea. It's a very complicated aircraft to fly. If you're an expert, as the final pilots were, it worked. Uh, but if you were, had no, very little experience on, on any kind of aircraft, never mind a fast jet fighter, you would have been dead. Strange enough, one unit of Hitler Youth did become operational with the 162 in the closing weeks of the war. Unfortunately, all the records have been lost, so we don't know how they actually fared in combat. Conversion training to the Combat 162 was handled at a flight school in Vienna, headed by Hunkel's technical director, Karl Frank. The first regular Luftwaffe Volksjager fighter group, JG-1, became operational at Lech in Germany in April 1945, with 100 aircraft organized in two wings. It was commanded by Oberst Herbert Eilfeld. The first operational mission was flown on the 26th of April 1945, only days before the end of the war. Because the pilots lacked experience with the new plane, Flight Lieutenant Reichberger was shot down but escaped uninjured. On May the 4th, 1945, the People's Fighter drew first blood. Lieutenant Rudolf Schmidt shot down a British Royal Air Force fighter. It would be the Volksjager's only kill. World War II ended two days later. Well, it was tested by senior British pilots after the war, and they gave it a very good bill of health. They said it was a very stable gun platform. They said because it was small, it would have been very difficult to hit by Allied fighters. So all in all, if it had got into production in a big way and got into action in a big way, it might have caused a lot of damage. Indeed, the senior British jet pilot of the time said that it would have run rings around a British meteor. Would the Volksjager have tipped the balance in Germany's favor if the war had gone on longer? Ernst Heinkel was already planning more advanced versions of the Volksjager. If the war had lasted into 1946, these are the planes the Allies would have faced. For extra speed, a swept wing version was already under construction. The tail was also modified into an elegant butterfly shape to improve performance. With new, more powerful jet engines, this HE-162 would have been a match for the 1950s US jets, like the F-86 Sabre. Another planned version of the Volksjager was one fitted with two ram jets of the kind used by the V-1 cruise missile. When the V-1 was catapulted into the air at great speed, air was forced into the jet nozzle. This combined into an explosive mixture with low-grade gasoline suitable for a lawnmower. The result burned like a blowtorch. Fitted with two of these crude engines, this version of the HE-162 would have been a kind of manned V-1. It was planned as a last-ditch weapon if normal jet fuel ran out. The most exotic of all was this version of the Volksjager with forward swept wings. Not till the 1980s would NASA fly such a plane. But it was not to be. On the 8th of May 1945, the Volksjagers of JG-1 were captured by advancing British forces at their base at Lech. The combat days of the People's Fighter ended with the surrender of Nazi Germany. But we can now reveal that the HE-162 Volksjager was still to play a major part in post-war aviation history. After World War II, the French leader, General de Gaulle, was anxious to rebuild a French air force. The key was to be the Volksjager's engine, the BMW 003. The designer of this jet engine was Dr. Hermann Ostrich. As the Nazi regime collapsed, Ostrich escaped into neutral Switzerland. There, he set up a company to continue his work. To disguise its origins, the company was called a French name, Atelier Technique Aeronautique Reckenbach, or ATAR. In December 1945, General de Gaulle's government paid for Ostrich and ATAR to move to France with 120 colleagues from his old BMW team. 
Using BMW's Volkswagen jet engine technology, Austrich quickly designed a more advanced engine. This was test run southeast of Paris in 1948. Versions of this engine were used to power early French fighters, such as the Dassault Mystère and the twin engine Vauteur. By an irony of history, France supplied these aircraft to Israel during the 1950s, when American aircraft were embargoed, thus allowing the Israeli Air Force its victories over the Arabs. Ultimately, a development of Austrich's Volkswagen engine powered the famous Dassault Mirage supersonic jet fighter. The Mirage would also employ another invention of the German wartime aviation industry, the Delta Wing, developed by Walter Lippisch. Imagine what Adolf Hitler's Luftwaffe might have done with such a powerful engine in an HE 162 with forward swept wings for speed. It was not to be. After the largest tank battle in history at Kursk in 1943, the Red Army rose relentlessly towards the very borders of Germany. The Luftwaffe uses the famous Ju-87 as a tank buster. But by 1944, the Stuka is obsolete, too slow to evade fighters of the Red Air Force. What is needed to stop the Russian tanks is a new Stuka, powered by the revolutionary new jet propulsion. The dive bomber was invented in America by Glenn Curtis, who built sturdy biplane dive bombers for the US Navy. September the 27th, 1933, Buffalo, New York. Fate is about to play a strange hand. Visiting the Curtis plant at Buffalo is Germany's greatest living World War I fighter ace, Ernst Uday, now a senior figure in Hitler's new Luftwaffe. Glenn Curtis invites Uday to test fly a factory fresh Curtis Hawk dive bomber. Impressed, Uday cables Luftwaffe chief Erhard Milch to buy the Hawk. Two months later, Uday will fly the first German version in front of Göring. Equally impressed by the accuracy of the Hawk's bombing, Göring orders a German equivalent, the Junkers Ju 87 Stuka. One man who is not impressed is looked off a general. Walter Weber. Weber wants large long-range bombers to attack Russia, not small tactical dive bombers restricted to supporting the army. But Weber is killed in a freak air crash in 1935. With Weber gone, Milch and Uday cancel Germany's equivalent of the B-17, the so-called Ural bomber. They think dive bombing using the Stuka will be more accurate. Alone of the great powers, Germany will lack a successful heavy bomber in any numbers during World War II. Well, in the initial period of the air war, it was very effective because the Germans had complete uh, uh, air superiority and the uh, JO-87s could be used uh, for uh, frontline purposes, the purposes for which they designed uh, that is true, but that didn't last for very long because as the Russians gradually recovered their, their, their capability, and that is in 1942, then aircraft like the Ju-87 had, had a difficult time. On the other hand, the Germans, I think, were very adept because they basically altered the role of the Ju-87 uh, and began to realize it could be used not, as I say, just in a, a tactical dive bombing or forward uh, air support role, but could be used for something else of which a very good example, of course, is Rudel's uh, use of the Ju-87s in a tank-busting role. Poland, September 1939, and the German Blitzkrieg rolls over Poland. Earlier and better days for the Luftwaffe. Success lies in using the amazing Ju-87 dive bomber, the infamous Stuka, as flying artillery to clear a path for the advancing panzers. The Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber was the most famous German aircraft of World War II. Over 5,700 were built. But its slow cruising speed of only 174 miles an hour made it prey to Allied fighters as World War II progressed. Something faster was needed. In 1943, the German Air Ministry instructed the Henschel Company to begin work on a jet replacement for the Stuka, the Henschel HS-132. The HS-132 had a planned maximum speed of 484 miles per hour and a range of nearly 700 miles.